Okay, very good evening to you. Welcome tonight to our midweek Bible study, the first of the uh, new season. And we are tonight in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36. Isaiah chapter 36. We're going to begin reading in verse 1 and read it down to verse 10. Isaiah chapter 36 and verse 1, reading down to verse 10. And our thought is the man who saw tomorrow. And we're just going to see tonight how accurately he saw tomorrow and uh, how that his prophecy was fulfilled. But let's begin in Isaiah chapter 36 and verse 1. And it says, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, that they are but fain words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now in whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed, on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for this evening, for the opportunity to gather tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the presence and, uh, of God the Father and indeed, uh, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we open the Word of God tonight, we pray that you would reveal its truth to our hearts, that you would help me as I seek to expound these scriptures to do so with accuracy and to be able to teach in a way that is comprehensible and helpful to everyone who is gathered here. And I pray, Lord, you just use this time for your glory and for the glory of your Son and for the edification of your people. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you remember exactly where we were when we last left off before lockdown, but it's been a while since we uh, come back to this study. Uh, but just to give you an idea, there's Isaiah at a glance. And we've already covered the prophecies against Judah and the prophecies against the nations. Then we looked at the prophecies of the day of the Lord and prophecies of uh, judgment and blessing. And so the whole of that first section, the first 35 chapters, were prophetic and were indeed centered upon judgment on those various nations and peoples. So we move now to this central section, which is historic. It's a transitional section. It covers Hezekiah's salvation, his sickness, and his sin. And really this section, as I say, is transitional. It's a bridge between the Old Testament section and the New Testament section of the book of uh, Isaiah. Uh, chapters 36 and 37 are historical, and they speak of the Assyrian threat to Jerusalem, and they highlight how accurate Isaiah's prophecy was 30 years after he delivered it. 
Then in chapters 37 and 38, we will enter again into prophecy, and they will deal with the Babylonian invasion and the point to the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, these chapters, and if you have, we haven't got time tonight, but if you have the time, do go back and read the chapters of 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 and 2 Chronicles 32 and 33, and you will find reference to the things we're going to talk about tonight, because what you have in chapter uh, 36 and 37 is a repeat of the history chapters of the Kings and the Chronicles. Now, before we get into chapter 36, there are some things we need to understand concerning its background. This chapter deals with, with the event of an incursion into the land of Judah by King Sennacherib of Assyria. And uh, when they first arrived into the land, Hezekiah sought to oppose, appease uh, King Sennacherib with gifts. He even cut gold from the door of the temple uh, in order to satisfy him. But all of that was to no avail. And soon the Assyrian army, having already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, was now camped at the threshold of the city of Jerusalem. Now you've heard me tell you, and I've said it many, many times, that there is no ink wasted in the Word of God, that every word is important. And here we're given in chapter 36 and verse 1 an important little detail. We read, now it came to pass, notice, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. That's the 14th year of his reign. And that's important because if you look at chapter 38, and verse 1, it tells us that in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Now, we know, and we'll cover this in the course of our studies, that God in his grace added 15 years to Hezekiah's life. And we'll see that in detail as we go along. But we should know that he began reigning upon the throne of Judah when he was but 25 years of age. Go back with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to look at the second verse. 1 Kings chapter 18 and the second verse. Sorry, 2 Kings, I should have said, not 1 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 18 and uh, the second verse. Verse 1 tells us that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And it says, 20 and 5 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years. Now notice that. We're told two things. He's 25 when he begins to reign, and he reigns for 29 years. That means he died when he was 54. You get that? 25 plus 29 equals 54. Now we know that he had 15 years added to his life, to the end of his life. So if you take 15 from 54, that brings you to the age of 39. He's 39 when he is struck down with this illness. Now this chapter has told us in the 14th year of his reign, Sennacherib came and he threatened Hezekiah's rule. Well, if you think about that, if he began reigning at the age of 25 and Sennacherib comes in the 14th year, that means he's 39 years of age. In other words, he's, as he's being attacked by the Assyrians, he's not only suffering a political threat, but he has a personal problem. He is sick unto death. He has an ailment, a very serious illness that is life-threatening. And you see here, friends, something of the cruelty of Satan. Satan doesn't care how sick you are. He doesn't care how sad you are. He doesn't care whether you're distressed or you're troubled. He's coming for you because he is a cruel and cold enemy. I remember many years ago in Northern Ireland, a man was shot, sadly shot to, de to death as he was uh, out of the doctors. And uh, they entered 
Rupert Mayor of Belfast the next day, and of course he was condemning the shooting, uh, and then he said this thing that always sort of made me think how ironic. He said, imagine shooting a man, he says, imagine shooting a man when he's sick. And I thought to myself, well, what difference does it mean? What's it matter whether he's sick or he's well? I mean, the terrorist isn't going to say to you, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm feeling a little poorly. Well, I'll come back tomorrow. No, that's not the way this thing works. It's very cruel. It's very cold. And so it is with the enemy of our soul, Satan. He doesn't care how sick we are. But nevertheless, he's going to go on the offensive. And there's something else here. Because we find in this text, Hezekiah, who is a son of David, upon whom the entire hope of the nation rests. And he's brought to the very door of death. And just as it looks like all is about to be lost, he is to be rescued so that the will of God might be fulfilled. And of course, that's typological. That points forward to the coming son of David, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who didn't just come to the door of death, but who went through the door of death. And in that moment, it might have looked like the hope of Israel was lost. But of course, he was raised from the dead gloriously on the third day so that God in his grace will show mercy to that nation and to mankind and that his will would be fulfilled. Well, let's look tonight at our subject matter and we're thinking about the devil's terms of surrender. And the first thing I want you to see in verses 1 through 3 is the approach of the Assyrians. It says, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Yoah, Asaph's son, the recorder. Now we know from the historical section of the Old Testament that King Sennacherib had rampaged through the land of Judah. He had taken one defense city after another. And now he's arrived at Lachish, which is also a fortress town in Judah. And from there, his intent is to take Jerusalem, to conquer the capital, and to complete his conquest. Now, if this was a game of chess, at this point, Sennacherib would be saying to Hezekiah, check. In other words, he's saying, this is the penultimate move. It's just one step to checkmate until the game is up. Now, all that we're reading here is absolutely founded in history. You know, in the British Museum in London, and those of you who went with us will have seen an entire room dedicated to this event, that there was the relief, uh, that not the relief of Lachish, but the relief of the siege of Lachish. Uh, and, and, uh, and the Assyrians had laid it all out for us how that they were conquering Judah, and uh, how that they had Hezekiah holed up. In fact, in that same museum, we saw the tailor's prison. And on that prison, you have the annals of King Sennacherib. And he states at this point that Hezekiah is holed up like a caged bird. That's his expression. He's like a caged bird. He says, I've got him. And I'm going to come in on him now, and I'm going to take his life, and I'm going to take his kingdom. And so this was a terrible time for Hezekiah, in ailing health with a foreign legion breathing down his neck. Now, whilst Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sat put at Lachish, he sends an envoy, Rabshakeh, to go and speak to Jerusalem and to uh, Hezekiah, the king of, of Judah, and to bring terms of surrender. Now, of course, he didn't come alone. The text tells us that he came here with a great army. And Rabshakeh 
is not a personal name. When you read it that way in the authorized version, it looks like that's his name. That's not his name, that's his title, okay? Uh, he's the Rabshaka, the field commander, the general. So here is uh, Sennacherib, and he has sent his general to go and settle this dispute and to secure the surrender of the king of Judah. Generals are often dispatched in times of war to negotiate you think about World War II, it was the General Dwight Eisenhower who uh, took the German surrender, and it was uh, Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, who negotiated and who accepted the Japanese surrender. So the Assyrian general comes seeking Jerusalem's unconditional surrender. And as they do, Rabshakeh finally shows up, notice, at the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's field. That was Jerusalem's main water supply at this point. Now, that he showed up here was strategically significant, and I'll tell you why. Because before he arrived, and before the Assyrian army came, the uh, men of Judah, the men of Jerusalem had gone out and they had filled all the wells of the land round about Jerusalem in order to, uh, to exhaust the uh, Assyrian army of any water supply. So that when they would seize Jerusalem, they would have to at least dig wells or find water and, and they would in some way stall the siege. But Rabshakeh comes to this point and he's letting Hezekiah know that he knows the geography of Jerusalem, that they have spies even among the Israelites who reported the very words uh, of the king. And that he, and knowing the layout of the city, knows where their water supply is. And there he stands upon it, as if to say, listen, all we've got to do to get water is cut you guys off. We don't have all the water we want. You're the ones who are going to be thirsting. But it was also spiritually significant that he stood there. Because we've already encountered this locality in Isaiah's prophecy. Look back to chapter 7 of Isaiah and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 3. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. Ahaz is Hezekiah's father. Thou and Shear Yashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Exactly the same location. Now, let me give you a quick uh, little bit of revision here. You may recall at that point in Isaiah chapter 7, Israel, the northern kingdom, and Syria were concerned about the rise of Assyria. And so they formed an allegiance to fend off the Assyrian threat. And they sought the support of King Ahaz of Judah to join with them in a confederation against the Assyrians. However, Ahaz refused. And so Israel and Syria decided that they would depose Ahaz as king of Judah, and they would put in a puppet king who would support their cause and who would agree to their political desires. So Ahaz was really up against it, even as Hezekiah was up against it. So God sent Isaiah along to speak with him, and he brings his son, Shear Jashub. You remember that name? It's one of those mouthfuls that Isaiah gave to his children. And it means a remnant shall remain. So he comes along and he says, listen, God is going to retain a remnant in this land. Here's my son, Shear Jashub. And it was right at this very place. And there Isaiah exhorts Ahaz to trust God. And he even invites him to seek a sign that all will be well if he trusts the Lord. Now, if you remember from our study all those months ago, Ahaz rejected that. He said he wouldn't behave presumptuously. And instead, what did he do? He sought to make an alliance with the Assyrians in order to stave off the threat from Israel and Assyria. Well, now Hezekiah is being tested from the very same spot that Rabshakeh comes to and makes his challenge, the very same spot that Ahaz was challenged from. And notice the words of Rabshakeh. Uh, you know, here's the question he asks in verse 4, what confidence, confidence is this? wherein thy trustest. He says, who are you going to trust? 
God or man? I know what you said. You said you have counsel and strength for war. Well, who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust God? You know, when, when we feel life's test, you know what God often does? He brings us back to the point of failure. He brings us full circle to the place of failure. Just as Ahaz had failed at this very locality, God brings Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, to that same location and offers another threat so as to test the son against the father. And uh, that's what we see being played out in history here. So Hezekiah sends out three of his best men, three members of his cabinet. He sends Eliakim, he sends Shebna, he sends Yohan. And they go out to meet Rab Shechem. And now in verses 4 through 20, we see the uh, argument of the Assyrians. Look what it says. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words, I say I have counsel and strength for war. Now in whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed. On Egypt, whereon if a man lean it will go into his hand and pierce it, so is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria. And I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be able in thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Yoha unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And speak not to us in the Jewish language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master or to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jewish language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his fine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharphaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Now, in spiritual terms, Rabshakeh probably got off to the worst possible start in his discussion with the three messengers of Hezekiah, because he refers in verse 4 to Sennacherib as the great king. Now, that's a title that belongs to God. He calls him the great king. Isaiah 47, verse 2 says, For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. And verse Psalm 48 tells us that Jerusalem is the city of the great king. And Psalm 95 and 3 says, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Twice in this dialogue, uh, Rab Shekha refers to Sennacherib as the great king. And so from the very first use of that term, at the entrance to the holy city, he had God's attention. The Lord was listening. 
Now, I pointed you to those six words in verse 5, in which Rabshakeh summarizes Hezekiah and Judah's predicament. He says, Now on whom dost thou trust? When you're ailing, who do you trust? When your spirit feels low, who do you trust? When the enemy is breathing down your neck, who will you trust? When you're living through a pandemic, who will you trust? Who will you trust? When it looks like the game is up, who will you trust? Now, earlier in this prophecy, Judah had been warned about trusting in Egypt. In fact, we looked at that in the earlier sections. Let's go back to chapter 30 in verses 1 and 2. Isaiah writes, chapter 30, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. And what is the sin that they add to sin? That walk to go down unto Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. Now, Rabshakeh's warning confirms Isaiah's own prophecy, that any thought Hezekiah may have had about relying on Egypt to help him, well, it would be ill-founded. Verse 6, Rabshakeh describes Egypt as a broken reed, in which if a man leans upon it, it will go into his hand. He says there's no strength in Egypt. Egypt will only wound you further. Egypt was weak and broken. Egypt was no means of support for the nation of Judah. And so what he's telling the king of Judah is this, you're on your own path. It's just you and me. It's just you and the king Sennacherib. Don't think for one moment that Pharaoh is going to come to your aid. That's not going to happen. But what if Hezekiah thought, well, fair enough, I'm going to just trust the Lord. Well, verse 7, he says, But if I say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? You see, if Hezekiah says, well, I'm going to trust in the Lord, Rabshakeh has an answer for this ready made. He says God was displeased with the king of Judah. Why? Because he had centralized his worship to Jerusalem, and he had closed down and destroyed the altars and the high places throughout the land. Now, of course, we know that those altars were idolatrous. But nevertheless, the people of Judah were, who were worshiping at those altars were doing so in the belief that they were worshiping the Lord. You see, they weren't looking them at those things as a God apart from Jehovah, but they saw them as representations of Jehovah. And so what Rabshakeh Rab says is this, well, you, you minimized the worship of Jehovah. You took the worship that was spread throughout all the land, and such was your arrogance that you focused it on this temple in your capital city, and God is displeased with you. Don't think for a moment you can trust in God. And then in verses 8 and 9, he mocks the men of Judah, suggesting that, you know, if they were relying on an army coming, a cavalry coming from Egypt, well, no such reinforcements would come, but that he himself would offer them 2,000 horses in return for a present, if indeed they could get any man to ride those horses. And then he says, even if you could ride 2,000 horses, any one of my captains will defeat you. Then he states that God has told him, in verse 10, to go up against the land. Now, of course, this was a lie. God had brought the Assyrians against Israel, but God was not bringing the Assyrians against Judah. Yet the people listening in from the walls of the city knew that Israel had fallen to Assyria. They believed that the prophets were true in the things that they said and that that was an act of God's judgment. And maybe they thought perhaps God has spoken to him. Perhaps indeed he is the instrument of God's chastisement. You know, at the mention of this supposed revelation then, the representative of Judah asks Rabshakeh to tone it down a little bit. They say, listen, will you do us a favor? Stop speaking to us in Hebrew. 
Would you speak to us in the language of Syria, in Aramaic? He says, we, we understand Aramaic, you understand Aramaic, but we don't want the people on the walls hearing what you have to say. Could you just tone it down a little bit and speak to us in a different language so that we can discuss these things in prophecy? But actually, Rabshakeh's purpose was to unsettle the people. Look at verses 12 and 13. He says, Has my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jewish language and Hebrew and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. He did the very opposite. He began to speak even louder to address the people on the wall. And he said, listen, you folks have been listening in. Now, do you really want to be using your body waste as fuel? Do you really want to be drinking your own urine as a means of quenching your thirst? Those were the conditions of siege in ancient times. Well, nobody wants to do that, do they? And so they're probably up in the wall thinking, well, you've made a big mistake here. You know, maybe we should just throw up the white flag of surrender and, and let them have it. And finally, he, and penultimately, he alarms the people by undermining the king. Look in verse 15. He says, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Syria. Hearken not to Hezekiah. For thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. Come out to me and eat every one of his fine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Rabshakeh says, Listen, guys, Hezekiah, he's deceiving you. He's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. He's trying to make you believe that you have a chance in this battle. And he says, the man is cruel insofar as he's deluding you in this way. But my king, King Sennacherib, well, he's a benevolent king. You know, if you will just surrender, you guys can stay where you are for a while. We'll not touch you. You know, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, eat every one of his own vine and every one of his fig tree and drink out of your own cistern. He says, look, I can go away from here and life will go on as normal. And then in due time, we'll come back and we'll work out who's going to go with us and who's going to go back to Assyria with us. And, and actually, he says, that's not bad. He says, Assyria is a land like yours. It's a land of, uh, of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. He almost makes it look like a travel brochure, doesn't he? Why have all this bloodshed when you can have a life of ease with us in sunny Assyria? And finally, he blasphemes the Lord outright. Verse 18. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Now, I told you that he got off to a bad start when he referred to his king as the great king. But man, if he got off to a bad start, he ended with a fatality because he challenges the Lord outright. You know, up to this point, he may have been winning the hearts and the minds of the people, but once he drew the honor of the Lord into it, he picked a fight with God. You cannot win when you pick a fight with God. Now, I look at the anxiety over the Assyrians in verses 21 and 22. But they held their peace. That is, the three representatives of Hezekiah held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Now, in response, what did they say at this point? Not one word. They didn't say yay, they didn't say nay. 
They didn't say, we think about it, we'll pray about it. They just went back to their king. That's what they were told to do, and they are to be commended for their obedience. Psalm 39, 1 says, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. That's exactly what they did. They didn't speak out of turn, and these three men are to be commended. They did very well, and yet with all, they were not affected by Rabshakeh's words. They were distressed by what they heard. They tore their clothes. They rent their clothes. That's a signal of distress. And so you can imagine as King Hezekiah is perhaps on his sickbed and he's beginning to feel the, the effect of this illness that is about to threaten his life. These men come in and they've torn their clothes off and they say to the king, it's terrible news. We're up against it. We're staring defeat in the face. Well, now I want you to think about how we can apply this to our own enemy. Because there are lessons in this chapter that reveal to us the strategy of our enemy, of the devil himself, of the demonic general who indeed wars against our souls and seeks our own surrender. I want you to see how he operates. Notice he demoralizes. That's what Rabshakeh did. That's what he did when he outlines the weakness of Egypt. He was seeking to isolate Judah. He was seeking to make Judah feel that they were all alone in this world. To tell Hezekiah that no one cared about his predicament. Nobody cared whether he lived or died. Nobody cared whether he was sick or well. Nobody cared whether he was the king of Judah or not. You know, the devil does that with us, especially when, like Hezekiah, we're suffering poor health or we're feeling low. He comes along and he isolates us. And he makes us feel abandoned. He feel, makes us feel cut off from all help. And he, and he says things like, you know, you, those people down in the church, they don't care. Did any of them phone you? Did anybody send you a card? No, they're just leaving you here. After all the years you've been at Milton, and now look with her. You see the kind of thing he does? He demoralizes. He deludes. Here Rabshakeh tells him that God is displeased with Hezekiah's destruction of the high places and the altars, and the king had made far too much of the temple in Jerusalem. You know, the devil does that also with us. Now, we don't have a central locality such as a temple in which to worship, but God has revealed the centrality of local churches among believers. And the local church is to be the primary focus uh, uh, in terms of our worship. It's the place where we gather as a company of God's people to be a physical testimony to our salvation and to the grace of our God. And yet many, many Christians and many Christians in this land feel it is absolutely acceptable to worship the Lord apart from the church. You know, we have adopted an entirely individualistic way of coming to God, where each person, it seems, makes up their own rules about how they deal with God and how they see him. You know, in, in the book Habits of the Heart, Robert Bela and his colleagues interview a young nurse named Sheila Larson, whom they describe as representing this view of religion. Speaking about her own faith and how it operates in her life, she says, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. It is Sheilaism, just my own little voice. You know, this pick and choose as I go along according to my inner voice approach is just like picking your own high place, picking your own altar, raising your own idol, and seeking to serve God the way you want to serve God instead of the way God wishes to be served. But that's what the devil would have us to do. And then he discourages. Rabshakeh offers the people of Judah an entire cavalry regiment, as if to say, well, you know what? Let's even the odds. Tell you what, I'll fight you blindfold with my hands behind my back and I'll still win. That's basically what he says. That's how arrogant he was. That's how cocky he was. And of course, the devil does the same thing. He tries to dishearten us so as to get us to give up, to say, it's too hard. It's too much. It's too far. I can't do this. He discourages. And he deceives. 
Rabshakeh claimed that God had spoken to him, despite the fact that God had already expressly stated his opinion concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Look in Isaiah chapter 33, if you will. Again, a little bit of revision for us. Isaiah chapter 33. And let's read verse 1. It says, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled. And dealt, dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of the, thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar. As the running to and fro of locusts shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion, Jerusalem, with judgment and righteousness, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. God says, listen, I am treasuring Jerusalem. I have a future for Jerusalem. But here comes Rabshakeh, and he says, no, nope, God has spoken to me. God has told me that I have to destroy this city. You know, I wonder how many there are today who say, the Lord has told me. Who step outside the page of the Scripture and say, the Lord has told me, only to pronounce matters which are unscriptural, untestable, or untrue. You know, there are people up and down this land who tell me they're prophets. You know, I think we must have some of the worst prophets in history. Because here we are in the current pandemic, you know, where was the prophecy concerning it? You'd think that would have been a pretty obvious prophetic statement to make. And yet not one of them, not one of them foresaw these conditions. Where are the healers? Surely to goodness, if people have the gift of healing, they have a responsibility to heal. And yet they were not healing. In fact, their pastors were, were contracting the illness, and some sadly passed away. And their churches were among the first to close, and they're among the last to open. Yet they'll say, but the Lord told me. The Lord told me. What did the Lord tell them? I'll tell you what he told them. Nothing. They would deceive us, claiming the Lord has spoken to me when he's done no such thing. Listen, if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. That's it. That's the revelation of God. And so the devil deceives and he discredits. Rabshakeh wanted the people to lose faith in their leadership. And the day of the devil does the same thing today. Honestly, you know, I grow so weary of Christians who publicly attack men in the ministry with a broad sweep. Now, every now and then, a, a pastor messes up, and maybe he is, is deserving somewhat of exposure, and he's deserving to be, uh, you know, spoken about in a negative context. But listen, there are people who go online, and they just rubbish pastors, all pastors, and they say the most wicked things. Rabshakeh said, listen, don't listen to Hezekiah. Now, remember the monarchs of Judah served not just as kings, but as pastors as well. And there are those who again profess Christ, who despise the office of the pastor, and who discredit the men who hold it, and who constantly harp and criticize so as to tear down their ministry. You know, God has given the churches pastors for the purpose of spiritual guardianship. Now, of course, pastors aren't perfect. Of course, pastors will sin from time to time. Of course, pastors are not infallible. But pastors who, despite their shortcomings, seek to have a biblical ministry and to live out the Bible in their lives and do so to the glory of God should be honored, not discredited. And so we must give no room to the devil's lies and his efforts to discourage those men and to discredit them. 
So what was Hezekiah to do? Well, I hate to say this, but you'll find out in next week's exciting episode. We'll see in chapter 37 what he did. But for the moment, let's not be ignorant of the devil's devices. Let's be aware of the subtle strategies he employs. Let us steel ourselves against him by God's grace, wearing the whole armor of God and refusing to raise the white flag of surrender. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts this evening.